Holger Peterson, and he'll speak about uh, integral actonians. Well, thank you very much for your introduction, Zinovi. It's, of course, a pleasure giving a talk at this prestigious seminar. And I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. In this lecture, I would like to share with you a number of casual observations about integral octonians, that is to say, about the unique octonian algebra over the integers that does not contain zero divisors. Before doing so, however, let me get the terminology straight by saying a few words about octonian algebras over arbitrary commutative rings. Octonian algebras over commutative rings are best understood within the more general framework of composition algebras. I define a composition algebra of rank R over an arbitrary commutative ring K as an unassociative K algebra C with the following properties. First of all, I assume C is finitely generated projective <coughs> of rank R greater than zero as a K module. Secondly, I assume C is unital. In other words, it contains an identity element. And thirdly, I assume there exists a quadratic form N sub C on C called the norm of C that is uniquely determined by the following two properties. A, N sub C permits composition in the sense that N sub C of one sub C is one and N sub C of X, Y equals N sub C of X, N sub C of Y for all X, Y in C and B, a regularity condition. If R is greater than one, then N sub C is regular in the sense that its polar form defined as displayed induces canonically an isomorphism, a linear isomorphism from the K module C onto its dual module C star. I then define the trace of C as the map from C to K, sending X to N sub C of one sub C comma X, which is a linear form and the conjugation of C as the map from C to C, sending X to X bar equal to T sub C of X times one sub C minus X, which is a linear map. And I say C is regular, if its norm has this property. It then follows immediately from the definition that C is regular if and only if either the rank is greater than one or the rank is equal to one and the base ring contains one half. Now let me proceed to a number of standard properties of composition algebras. So let C be a composition algebra of rank R over our commutative ring K. Then the following statements hold. First of all, the rank is one of the numbers one, two, four, or eight. B, C is an alternative algebra in the sense that it satisfies the left alternative law X times X, Y equal to X squared Y and the right alternative law yx times x equal to yx squared, equivalently by our teens theorem, any subalgebra of C on two generators is associative. C, the algebra is associative if and only if the rank is at most four. D, the algebra is commutative associative if and only if the rank is at most two. E, C satisfies what I call the hamilton cayley equation, X squared minus T sub C of X times X plus N sub C of X times one sub C equal to zero, equivalently using the conjugation of C X times X bar and X bar times X are both equal to N sub C of X times one sub C. F, 
The trace is an associative linear form in the sense that it vanishes on all commutators and all associators of the algebra. G, the conjugation of C is an algebra involution in the sense that it has period two and is an anti-homomorphism with respect to multiplication. And finally, the Cayley-Dixon construction works in this general context using a regular composition algebra B of rank S at most equal to four and an invertible element mu in the base ring as input, the Cayley-Dixon construction produces a composition algebra C equal to KB mu of rank R equal to two S as output. Let me now turn to a number of specific examples of uh, composition algebras. Composition algebras of rank two are also called quadratic et al, and they are commutative associative. Standard examples are the split quadratic et al's by definition isomorphic to k times k under the component wise multiplication. Composition algebras of rank four are called quaternions. They are associative, but not commutative. Standard examples are the split quaternions by definition isomorphic to the two by two matrices with entries and the base ring. And finally, composition algebras of rank eight are called octonians. They are alternative but not associative. Standard examples are the split octonians, by definition isomorphic to the Tron vector matrices as displayed here, where the multiplication is the ordinary matrix product twisted by vector product in three space. Let's now look at a Another specific example, namely the graves Cayley octonians. Here, the base ring is the field of real numbers. And I consider what I call O equal to the complexes times C cube, where C cube is three dimensional column space over C viewed as a right complex vector space. The whole thing though regarded as a real vector space of dimension eight. And I make this into an unassociative algebra by the product displayed here, where the bar refers to complex conjugation and the exponent T to passing to the transpose matrix or vector. It turns out that this is indeed an octonian algebra over the reals the Octonian algebra of Graves Cayley Octonians, whose norm is given by the formula N sub O acting on a pair A comma U is the square of the absolute value of A plus U bar transpose U. In particular, the norm is positive definite. So much for my brief excursion into Octonian algebras over arbitrary commutative rings. Let me now return to my original topic, namely integral octonians. The standard reference to this topic is a classical paper by Coxeter published in 1946 under the title Integral Cayley Numbers with Duke Mathematical Journal. If you do what I did, namely study this paper systematically from beginning to end, you will encounter along the way quite a few remarkable properties. The first remarkable property you encounter is that Coxeter, when working on this topic, tried to understand an earlier paper by Kirmse, Johannes Kirmse, dating back in 1924, published with the Saxonian Academy of Sciences under a very long and typically German title, which reads as follows. If you care for an English translation, 
Well, here it is. On the representability of natural integers as sums of eight squares and a non-commutative and non-associative number system connected with this problem. Now, Kilms's name in mathematics will forever be associated either with Kilms's identities or with Kilms's mistake. The story behind Kilms's identities is very simple. Consider an arbitrary composition algebra over our base ring K and combine the, the conjugation of that algebra, say C, with alternativity and the Hamilton Cayley equations, then it is immediately seen that left alternativity is equivalent to the left Kirmza identity x times x bar y equal to n sub c of x times y, and right alternativity is equivalent to the right Kirmza identity y x bar times x equal to n sub c of x times y. If you look at Kirmza's paper, you will see these identities established and used apparently for the first time in the mathematical literature. So it seems that uh, the terminology used here pretty much reflects uh, the historical development of the subject in an accurate way. But note that the notion of an alternative algebra was not available to Kilms at the time it was you introduced by Max Traun a few years later. And note also that while alternativity makes sense in arbitrary non-associative algebras, Kilms's identities do not, they make sense only in non-associative algebras with some sort of conjugation. So much for Kilms's identities. The story behind Kilms's mistake is much more complicated and goes back to the 1860s, more precisely to the year 1867, when Henry John Stephen Smith, in a paper with the Proceedings of the Royal Society, published a paper where he proved in a non-constructive manner that there exists what I call a positive definite unimodular integral quadratic lattice of rank eight. I will define this notion in a moment, but let me just add that 10 years later in, nine, in 1877, Korkina and Zolotarev published a paper in Mathematische Annalen where they identified this lattice explicitly and connected it with a sphere packing problem. This connection came to the fore again in 2017, when Vyazovska proved in a paper with the Annals of Mathematics that the densest sphere packing, uh, the densest sphere packing in dimension eight is provided by the preceding lattice and has density pi to the four over 384. Now, what exactly is a positive definite unimodular integral quadratic lattice? I define such a lattice of rank N as a pair M comma Q with the following properties. First of all, M is a free additive abelian group of rank N. And secondly, Q from M to the integers is a positive definite integral quadratic form, which is also regular. The latter condition meaning that the polar form of Q with respect to any Z basis of M has a matrix which is positive definite of size N with integral entries and even ones on the diagonal. And most importantly, it has determinant one. If you change scalars from the integers to the real, M becomes an honest good to goodness lattice in n-dimensional space. 
and Q becomes an honest to goodness, positive, definite inner product on n dimension space. Now it is known from the theory of modular forms, for example, that such positive definite unimodular integral quadratic lattices exist only in ranks divisible by eight. So eight is the smallest possible number where such a phenomenon can occur. Moreover, in this special case, in other words, if n is equal to eight, then this lattice is uniquely determined, at least to isometry. And in fact, it is the E8 lattice that is the lattice generated by the roots of the root system E8 in eight dimensional space. Now, how does Kilms's name enter into this picture? In order to understand this, a brief look at his academic career might, may help. Johannes Kilmse was born in 1894, began the study of mathematics and physics at the University of Leipzig in 1914, was drafted into the German army in 1915 and took part in the nightmare World War I until he was discharged from the German army in 1919 and resumed his study of mathematics and physics at the University of Leipzig. Finally, in 1923, he received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Leipzig with a thesis entitled in German, in English translation, contribution to the theory of finite fields in the domain of the quaternions. Now, this is obviously a topic from algebra or number theory so you would expect an advisor who was an algebraist, but that is not so. His advisor was Gustav Helglotz, who had made a name of himself by outstanding research contributions to such diverse fields as analysis, mathematical physics, and astronomy. Now, after his PhD, Kilmes eventually became a high school teacher at some Prussian high school. What eventually would lead to Kilmes' mistake originally started out as something completely different. The bold attempt of a young mathematician entering into the field of a high school teacher to investigate the arithmetics of the graves Octonians a bizarre topic even by today's standards, let alone the ones of 100 years ago. But by doing so, Kirmse may very well have initiated the theory of alternative algebras, because Emil Artin, one of the towering figures of 20th century mathematics, had also been a PhD student at the University of Leipzig, he had graduated from that department uh, in 1921, so two years prior to Kilmse, and his advisor had been none other than Gustav Herglotz himself. So it is very likely that Artin, Artin's long life, uh, long love for our alternative algebras. Uh, just think about Artin's theorem I mentioned a few minutes ago, and his first PhD student, Max Zorn, was inspired by Kilmes' paper of 1924. Now, what exactly happened in this paper? Now, as I mentioned before, Kilmes studied the real algebra O of graves Cayley Octonians, which he defined as was customary at the time by a weird multiplication table relative to them to some basis. Kirms then managed by a judicious choice of new basis vectors to exhibit a lattice M and O that contains the identity element on which the norm of O is not only positive definite, but also takes values in the integers and 
is a regular quadratic form over z. Therefore, by what I have mentioned before, the pair m comma n sub o restricted to m must be the E8 letters, at least up to isometry. But Kilmse was not aware of this, of course, nor was he aware, it seems, with the papers by Smith and Korkina Zolotarev. And now a very strange thing happens. Kilmse claims, amazingly without proof, that this lattice M is closed under the multiplication of the octonian algebra O over the reals, hence M itself must be in the terminology we have introduced an octonian algebra over the integers. More than 20 years later, Coxeter in 1946 tried to verify Kilmes' claim, but got stuck. And eventually he was able to show that Kilmes' claim is false. Thus, Kilmes' mistake was born. Coxeter then turned to Bruck one of the leading experts in non-associative systems at the time, and Brock managed to modify Kilmes' construction to obtain a version of the E8 lattice that is indeed closed under the product of the real K graves Cayley octonians Thus, the Coxeter octonians were born. But the story does not end here because when I continued studying Coxeter's paper systematically, after a few pages, I came across a reference, a reference to a paper by Mala published with the Royal Irish Academy, which puzzled me a great deal. Because here was Coxeter's paper of 1946, exhibiting apparently for the first time a non-split octonian algebra over the integers. And four years earlier, Mahler published a paper on a very similar, possibly even identical topic, which looked very strange indeed. Now, when I looked at Mahler's paper more closely, I found out that he referred to a paper by Dixon dating back to 1923 published in the Journal de Mathematique Pure et Appliquée. And in this paper, as Mala mentioned and observed, Dixon constructs an octonian algebra over the integers, which is rather easily shown to be isomorphic to the one exhibited by Coxeter. Thus, the dixon Coxeter octonians were born. To sum things up at this stage, let me just add, mention a theorem that was proved a little later by Vanderbilt and Springer in 1959, which says that up to isomorphism, the dixon coxeter octonians are the unique octonian algebra over the integers that does not contain zero divisors. Now, let me briefly return a little bit to Mahler's paper of 1942. In this paper, Mahler studied the one-sided ideals in the dixon coxeter octonians but the results he obtained have meanwhile been superseded by more recent developments. Let me mention in this context, the recent theorem of, 90, of 2021, which refers to composition algebras over arbitrary commutative rings and says the following. Let C be a composition algebra of rank R greater than one and identify the base ring in C in the usual way. Then we have a natural or natural inverse bijections between the ideals of the base ring and one, the ideals of C stabilized by conjugation if the rank is two, Two, the two-sided ideals of C if the rank is four, and the one-sided ideals of C if the rank is eight. 
Let me add as an additional, additional remark that only part three of this theorem is really new, parts two and one being implicit, at least implicit in the literature. And let me add also that in the special case of the Dixon Cartridge Daltonians, part three has been established earlier by Vanderblind Springer in 1959 and with a different proof by Alcock in 1999. Let me briefly say a little bit about the proof of this result in the special case that the rank is eight. In other words, that we are dealing with octonian algebras. So let C be an octonian algebra over K, let A in K be an arbitrary ideal, and let I in C be an arbitrary one-sided ideal. Then the following steps can be performed. One, by localizing and after that realizing C by means of the Cayley Dixon construction, it follows that I is in fact a two-sided ideal. Second one shows that if I intersects K trivially, then I itself must be trivial. Thirdly, one shows that I is equal to its intersection with K times C, and this follows from the preceding statement by extending scalars to the quotient of K mod I intersected with K. And finally, one shows for any ideal A and K that A is equal to A C intersected with K. Assertions three and four immediately imply what we want. Now, the final topic of my talk today will be, I would like to uh, advertise a generalization of the ordinary Cayley Dixon construction that allows for an intrinsic description of the Dixon Coxeter Octonians in a more general context. And this construction is what I call the non-orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction. In order to understand the impact of this construction, it is important to begin with the author with the ordinary Cayley, with a detailed description of the ordinary Cayley Dixon construction, and to do so in a more general context than the one provided by composition algebras. This more general context is provided by what I call conic algebras. I define a conic algebra of rank R over an arbitrary commutative ring as a non-associative K algebra C satisfying the following conditions. You will be familiar with the first two of these, the first one being that C is finitely generated projectable rank R greater than zero as a K module. And the second will be that C is unitary. But rather than requiring that C be endowed with a norm that permits composition and is regular most of the time, I only require that there exists a quadratic form and subsequent C, again called the norm of C and uniquely determined by first of all, a normalization condition, and secondly, by the validity of the hamilton cayley equation, where T sub C of X is defined as before. T sub C is of course, of course called the trace of C, and iota sub C from C to C, sending X to X bar is of course called the conjugation of C. But iota sub C, is just a linear map of period two, which may or may not be an algebra in volution. It is clear from the definitions that composition algebras are conic algebras, but conversely, if you've got a conic algebra of rank R over K called C, then this is a composition algebra if and only if it is alternative and the norm is regular or the rank is one. Let me now proceed 
to the details of the ordinary Cayley Dixon construction. The input is a Carnegie K algebra B and a scalar mu in the base ring, completely arbitrary, possibly equal to zero. The output will then be a unital K algebra C equal to KB mu on the direct sum of two copies of B as a K module under a bilinear multiplication that is uniquely determined by the following two properties. First, B when identified in C through the initial sum end is a unital subalgebra and the following multiplication rules hold. These multiplication rules may look a bit odd, but I will provide a natural motivation in a few minutes. It then follows that this algebra C is again a conic algebra, this time of rank 2R, whose identity element, norm, trace, and conjugation are respectively given by the following formulas. In particular, the norm of C is isometric to the orthogonal sum of the norm of B and minus mu times the norm of B. Therefore, we often speak of the orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction in the present context. Now let's proceed to the motivation I just announced a few seconds ago. So let C be an arbitrary alternative conic algebra over K and B and C a unital subalgebra and L in C an element which is perpendicular to B with respect to the polarized norm. Then one may ask, how does the subalgebra of C generated by B and L look like? Well, the answer is very simple when it comes to the module structure. It's simply the direct sum of B and BL. So B plus BL, it, I'm sorry, it's not a direct sum, at least not in general, it's just a sum. B plus BL is the subalgebra of C generated by B and L. And secondly, we have the following multiplication rules, which you have just seen in a slightly different context in the abstract version of the ordinary Cayley Dixon construction. So, this is the motivation I have in mind. And I'm now asking, <coughs> excuse me, the following question What happens if we drop in this setup the assumption? that L be perpendicular to B and relax it to L being an arbitrary element in C. Then we can look at the linear form S from B to K, sending U to N sub, U, N sub C of U comma L, which measures the deviation of L from being perpendicular to B. And we can show as before, that B plus BL is the subalgebra of C generated by B and L. Moreover, we can derive multiplication rules analogous to equation two involving only the input algebra B, its conjugation iota sub B, the linear form S, and the scalar mu equal to minus N sub C of L. If you ignore where these uh, multiplication rules come from and elevate them to axioms, you arrive quite naturally at what I call the non-orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction. The input is a Carnegie K algebra C B, a scalar mu in the base ring, and a linear form S from B to K. The output is a K algebra C, a unital K algebra, I should say, equal to KB mu S on the direct sum of two copies of B as a K module under the unique bilinear multiplication with the following properties. First of all, B when identified in C as before is a unital subalgebra and with lambda equal to 
S of one sub B, we have the following multiplication rules. Now these rules look pretty complicated, but you will see in a moment's time that if S is equal to zero, these multiplication rules collapse to the ones you have encountered with the ordinary Cayley Dixon construction. In other words, the non orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction becomes the orthogonal one if S is equal to zero. Now it follows that the output algebra C is a conic K algebra whose identity element, norm, trace, and conjugation are respectively given by the following formulas. I'm sorry. Now, be, uh, let me phrase the key question that I would like to ask of the non-orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction. So let us consider the input setting, a conic algebra B over K, a scalar mu in the base ring, a linear form on B, and let us denote by C equal to K B mu S, the corresponding non-orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction. Then we ask the following question. What are the conditions in terms of the input B mu S under which the output C is a regular conic algebra? In other words, it's norm is a regular quadratic form, and in particular under which, under additional assumptions, the output algebra is in fact an octonian algebra. Now I will answer this question by considering two cases. In the first case, I will look at the situation where the input algebra is regular. So I assume that the algebra B is a regular conic algebra. Then the linear form S <clears throat> by regularity is represented by the polarized norm. So there is unique element A and B such that S of U equals N sub B of A comma U for all U in B. Then one checks easily that the output algebra, the non-orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction C is in fact an orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction. More precisely, it is isomorphic to the orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction KB comma mu prime, where mu prime is equal to N sub B of A plus mu. In particular, C is an octonian L if and only if B is a quaternion algebra and this scalar is invertible in the base ring. From these simple observations, we can conclude the case of a regular input algebra is not interesting. Let's now pass on to the case of non-regular input algebras. The first subcase I would like to discuss it's actually a special case, is related to purely inseparable field extension, a topic that had been investigated by Skip Gary Baldi and myself way back in 2011. Here I consider an arbitrary field of characteristic two and a purely inseparable field extension B over K of exponent one. So this means that the square of every element in B lands back in K. This means further that the mapping sending X to X squared is a, makes, is, a, is a quadratic form on B making B a conic algebra. This norm, this quadratic form is anisotropic, but it's polar form is identically zero. So, P, so B is as far away from being a composition algebra as it could possibly be. I then, oops, 
that's the wrong direction. I then consider a linear form S on B, which is unital in the sense that it sends the unit element of B to the unit element of K. Then I can show that the non-orthogonal Katy Dixon construction KB mu S is a regular, is a regular conic algebra. So its norm is a regular quadratic form over this field of characteristic two. I can even say more, the norm of C is a Pfister quadratic form over K, and it can be shown that every anisotropic Pfister quadratic form over K can be written in this way. More specifically, the following conditions are equivalent. One, C is a division algebra in the usual sense. Two, the norm of C is anisotropic. From these observations, it follows that the following corollary holds. Every anisotropic Pfister quadratic form over a field of characteristic two is the norm of some conic division algebra. This theorem, this corollary is definitely false in characteristic different from two. For example, for the field of real numbers, where this corollary runs into conflict with the Bob Milner Cavell theorem. Let me now pass to another instance where a non regular input algebra produces via the non orthogonal Cayley Dixon construction a regular output algebra. And I will refer to this instance as weakly regular input algebra. The situation is as follows. I assume that K is an integral domain with quotient field F. I assume that B is an associative conic algebra of rank four, which is weakly regular in the sense that the linear map from B to its dual induced by the polarized norm is injective, but possibly not bijective. Then it follows that the base change of B from K to F is a quaternion algebra over F. Because F is flat over K, so BF continues to be weakly regular, but F is a field, so it must in fact be regular. Also, it is associate of rank four, therefore it must be a quaternion algebra. Furthermore, the dual of B identifies inside of BF as B sharp, the set of all axes described here. In particular, B sharp is a finitely generated projective K module, yeah, K module of rank four. Now we find because B sharp is finitely generated a non-zero quantity delta in the base ring that B sharp is contained in delta inverse B. Moreover, if we change scalars from uh, K to F, the corresponding base change of the linear form F is represented by the polarized norm of BF. And this element A must actually be an element of B sharp because S maps the elements of B into the base ring. In particular, it follows that A may be written in the form delta inverse times A naught, where A naught is an element of B. So we may look at the norm of A naught, which I denote by epsilon, and this is an element of K. With all these data, I can now phrase the following theorem. If the, if the quantity epsilon plus delta squared times mu is a unit in the base ring, then the output algebra C equal to KB mu S is an octonian algebra over K. Here is an example. Well, before I mention this example, let me just state the converse of this result is not true. Now let me come to the example. Here K 
is the ring of rational integers. H is the algebra of Hamiltonian quaternions, not over the or not over the reals as it or ordinarily is, but over the rationals only. Let one i j k be the standard basis of H with the standard relations, and look at B, the additive subgroup of H generated by this basis put mu equal to minus one and define a linear form S on B with values in the integers by throwing the first three basis vectors to one and the last one to zero. Then the base chain that I'm sure they B is weakly regular as an associative conic algebra of rank four over the integers and its base change to the quotient field, in other words, to the rational, is the Hamilton Hamiltonian quaternions. Moreover, B sharp, which I have defined earlier, is easily seen to be one half times B. So the quantity delta may be chosen to be two. The base change of S to the rationals may be written as the polar, polar form of NH in this form where A is one half A naught and A naught is one plus I plus J. And one checks that the norm of A naught is equal to three. Therefore, we conclude that the critical quantity epsilon plus delta squared mu is a unit is minus one in the integers. And it follows from the preceding theorem that the non-orthogonal Cayley-Dixon construction produced with these data is the algebra of dixon coxeter octonians because by the theorem, it is an octonian algebra and its generic fiber is the unique rational Octonian division algebra. Well, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Are, are there any questions? Yeah, uh, Holger, I, 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 can I ask a question? Please. Sure. Yeah, so you mentioned about uh, Coxeter uh, octonians uh, containing a lattice uh, which is closed under the product and uh, it gives you the lattice of E8. So are there similar observations about quaternions, for example? Yes, I mean, the, there are similar things that can be done. The, uh, the, the arithmetic analog of the Coxeter or the Dixon Coxeter octonians are the Hurwitz quaternions. This is a, in my terminology, a conic algebra over the integers, but it is not a quaternion algebra because its, it's, it's discriminant is not a unit. It's, I think it's 24, I'm not sure. And uh, in any way, uh, the Horvitz quaternions are very important for arithmetic reasons. And if you recall, I mean, the, in, in the 19th century, I think it was Jacobi who proved uh, formulas for the number of ways an integer, for example, can be written as a sum of four or eight or many other numbers of squares. And by using the Horvitz quaternions, Horvitz was able to prove this, uh, these formulas of Jacobi's who had used uh, theta series in a purely arithmetic setting. And Kilmser was actually able to prove analogous formulas for, uh, for the sums of eight squares. And though Kilmser made a mistake in his paper, these formulas are correct because in his proof, he only used that the lettuce he was working with was the E8 lettuce. He did not use the fact or his presumed fact that this lettuce was closed under multiplication. So this part of his arguments was correct. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, any other questions? May I ask a question? Please. Thank you. So uh, I was wondering about other commutative rings. Um, so when we have an octonian algebra over a commutative ring, it might not uh, be the result of the orthogonal Cayley-Dixon uh, process. Exactly. So is it known to what extent octonian algebras over commutative rings in general are obtainable through the non-orthogonal Cayley-Dixon process? No, I'm afraid not. I, ha I, I have no idea what kind of results to expect and I didn't work on these uh, more recently. So I, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about this, this problem, but I think it's an interesting question. Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe, I'm sorry, maybe I should say one word about this. It's, you see, um, if you take an octonian algebra over any commutative ring, and suppose you have a subalgebra of rank four, which may not be a quaternion algebra, then uh -huh. it is possible to show that the, the octonian algebra can be reached from this subalgebra by means of the non-orthogonal Cayley-Dixon construction. But of course, Ooh. the important the important hypothesis is you must have a rank four subalgebra to begin with. Right, but not necessarily a composition subalgebra. No, absolutely just, no. Right, just uh, it may be very degenerate. Right, right. And and where can I find this result, if I may? Is it... Well. Uh, Let's put it. I send you an email with the, with the link. Thank you very I, much. I, I don't. It's it's in the Journal of Algebras and Applications. Uh, one of the editors is Ivan Shestakov, uh, mm -hmm. and um, I, I send you the link. No problem. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I I would like a copy of that as well, if you don't mind. Okay, no problem. I, I will be happy to provide you with one. Are there any other questions? Uh, okay. Uh, is there a characterization of split composition algebras in terms of the norm, uh, just like over fields? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? I didn't uh, catch is it. Is there a characterization of split composition algebras uh, over rings in terms of their norms? Well, that's a very interesting question. I, th I think the person to ask is Philip. He has shown that uh, there are octonian algebras over rings which are not split, but their norms are split hyperbolic. Uh -huh. And this, hang this is related to the problem of isotopy of composition algebras, which I didn't touch upon in this talk. But I think Philip is the, the expert on this. And also, uh, Sardan also. So two of the authors of the, this paper, I think it was in the uh, Advances in Mathematics, if I remember correctly, where these things have been published. Thank you. I'll look it up, yeah. Any other questions? Um, so uh, the result, the uniqueness of the uh, Coxeter-Dixon algebra, I mean, can it be seen as a classification of uh, uh, H1Z uh, with uh, coefficients in, uh, in the Chevalier group of type G2? I mean, what about other yes, forms? Yes, absolutely. That's that's the way, I mean, you can approach these matters in different ways. And uh, by using this, uh, this relationship, uh, the description or the classification of octonians over the integers can be derived from what you've just said. 
Okay, so my question was, are there any other forms except the split one and the one uh, the, then the Coxeter Kale, uh, Coxeter Dixon? Oh, no. with the integers, there are no, are no other forms. And do we know anything about uh, other uh, Chevalier groups over Z? Exceptional ones, I should say. Is yes, uh, quite recently, uh, I think there, <coughs> there, there are connections, for example, Albert algebras over the integers have recently been classified by uh, Skip Gary Baldy, Michel Racine, and myself. And, and uh, actually, there are altogether four isomorphism classes of Albert algebras over the integers. Three are the ones you would expect, and the fourth one is kind of surprising. This is a, an example that had been exhibited by Elkies Gross in, I think, in 1996. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank the speaker again.